Um, what are the trends in Russian state media at the moment? What's the direction that that is moving? Well, I think you know the, the most obvious uh, example would be this this sort of conspiracy theory that was promulgated in the last 72 hours about uh, MH17 being shot down by Ukrainian fighter jets and you know this alleged satellite footage that was produced. Um, I don't think this was a coincidence that this came out at the same time that. Um, that Vladimir Putin was in, uh, attending the G20. Um, hmm. A lot of international pressure has been brought to bear on Russia. Uh, you know, the Kremlin sees itself as increasingly isolated and in this sort of pitched anti-Western uh, mode. So this was just another piece of nonsense thrown out into the ether. Oh, look over here. But in nonsense in terms of the fact, like, meant to deflect blame and focus on Putin to say, look, there are more questions, or what sort of nonsense? I think actually, you know, one of the, the, the sort of um, theses of our paper, our report, is to say that Kre Kremlin propaganda isn't designed necessarily to make people believe, um, mm -hmm. you know, these ludicrous theories and counter explanations or whatnot. It is designed to distract them, hmm. uh, and it's designed to misdirect. So, you know, again, uh, what happens? Uh, articles that would normally be filed about, um, you know, just how much of a pariah Putin has become, you know, the fact that, the, that Canada's prime minister sort of, uh, you know, said, I'll shake your hand, but I want you to get out of, uh, out of Ukraine first. I mean, all of these stories, uh, which, which tend to aggregate and cast this, this perception of Russia as a, a country alone, or a country because of its aggressive posture that has become, um, you know, pariah onto nations. That gets drowned out the minute mm -hmm. something like, ooh, new satellite footage showing this terrorist attack, uh, you know, the way it happened is not how you've been led to believe. Um, the problem with it is the, the, the production of it was so amateurish, it was so farcical. I mean, you know, Google image search debunked that claim within 30 seconds. That it, 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 it strikes me as a kind of um, a mode of desperation or an act of desperation. I think, I think the Kremlin is sort of, you know, casting about and doing everything and anything in its power to, to change the conversation or change but the to play, as as mm -hmm. But to play devil's advocate a little bit um, here, which is uh, maybe also a favorite card of some Russian media, though not only them, I mean, this idea of using propaganda that's not unique to Russia, what is it that Russia does that really makes it different or, or the way that it does it, I suppose? Well, I think, you know, uh, their, their clever trick, if you like, is they understand that the Western media um, is duty-bound to report, quote, both sides of the story, right? I mean, th there's a transparency and openness to the Western news cycle that there is not to the Russian news cycle, particularly now that independent media voices are being, um, you know, completely eclipsed or, or silenced. Um, so what, they, what, I, what I would say that, that, that Putin is, is very adept at doing is he seconds organizations like the BBC or the New York Times or the Washington Post makes them unwitting and unwilling accomplices in the dissemination of misinformation. Um, to give you one example that, that I like, um, when the chemical weapons attack in Syria was perpetrated in August of 2013, Alexander Lukashevich, the spokesman for the Foreign Affairs Ministry of Russia, said, oh, well, we can prove instantly that this whole thing was a hoax or it was, you know, staged for, you know, by the rebels to try and draw Western intervention. And his evidence was the first YouTube video showing the alleged victims of this chemical attack had been uploaded before the attack itself. Now, what he didn't realize is YouTube runs on California time, not Damascus time. So the real story there is the Russian Foreign Ministry doesn't know that the Earth moves around the sun in daily fashion, except that this actually was picked up by the mainstream media and sort of put out there as, you know, Russian Foreign Ministry says, Guta attack staged. So the problem I have, or, or, or one of the, the sort of um, recommendations we put forward in the report is, media can be a little more disciplined. It can exercise a little more restraint or better judgment in understanding that, look, uh, you are, to the Kremlin, a dupe, a useful idiot, or a patsy. I mean, you are being used to put stuff out there and to kind of sow uh, mm -hmm. skepticism or doubt or to inject some conspiracy. So what do you do? I mean, is it a question of the media becoming more active and having more agency as opposed to just being fed things? Or what do they do? Because the point that you make is that these ideas of freedom of the press and uh, you yeah. know being unbiased, that these have been abused and taken advantage of specifically by Russian state media for the purposes of propaganda and you know the interests of the state. So what, do, right. what needs to be built up to fight that? Well, I think, you know, ending a little bit of journalistic laziness when it comes to reporting on these issues, uh, you know, that can go a long way. And look, I, this is not to cast uh, aspersions at some of the excellent reporting that's been done on Ukraine by Western um, journalists. I mean, I can, I can name several of, off the top of my head who I think are just absolutely stellar in the field. But the problem is, as you well know, a reporter who reports, uh, you know, in Ukraine from, you know, the Donbass or whatever, 
it, it doesn't end with him, right? He files his piece or she files her piece. Then it goes through a series of, of, of sort of editorial mm. cleansings or, or rejiggerings. It winds up in the hands of a sub-editor who comes up with the headline and the stand first of the article. Look, just yesterday, and I, I tweeted this. I said this is a perfect case in point. CBS News had a, a headline that says, Russia claims new satellite footage shows who, who downed MH17. This was a full day after that, that supposed counterclaim or that new narrative of how MH17 was down had been completely debunked and embarrassed, including by the guy who, uh, this, this sort of MIT graduate who submitted this evidence to the Russian foreign ministry. So the whole story had fallen apart, and here you are. I mean, you have to understand, a general audience, whether in the West or anywhere, um, they see headlines, they see subheads. There is a psychological effect that these things have, right? Not everybody gets through an entire news story. You know, the, the concept burying the lead, you know, the thing that should actually be the real big story so often winds up in the second to last paragraph of a, of a news clipping. Mm. So, when, you know, if media sort of begins to understand that, look, we are being enlisted in this kind of campaign, uh, we don't like it because it embarrasses our professionalism, right? It serves the interests of, of, of a government when we're not supposed to be serving the interests of any government. A little bit of more discipline, a little more rigor and, and, and methodological soundness can go a long way. And again, you know, but what does that mean? That means you know, stepping back from when you get the story and then saying, you know, we'll hold off on this a minute, or this is real information. What what kind of rigor is needed, or well, what standards? Well, I was about to say. I mean, you know, the Lukashevich thing. That's something that you don't need a specialism in Russia to understand. That that's literally knowing YouTube runs on California time versus Syria time. Right. That's sure. the fascia, You know. I mean, so 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 looking at this stuff and saying, I mean. Let's be very candid here. Uh, I, I work in journalism, you work in journalism. You know, we, we deal with sources all the time. And one of the difficulties of our trade is knowing who to trust, right? Uh, sometimes people spin you, sometimes they lie to you. But, but if you have a source and all that person does to you is lie and dissimulate and, and embarrass you, right? All that person is giving you is stuff designed to serve his or her agenda. Eventually that person ceases to, ceases to be a source or if you have to quote or cite them, uh, you do so in a way that makes it clear that well, this is not a... And that brings me to another point, though. I mean, what is the issue of, of money here? Because part of what you're talking about, people not putting the right diligence in and, you know, being doing things that are quick, taking quotes that are there through wires as opposed to speaking to them themselves, it's the issue that, you know, you have fewer people working for news agencies, you have fewer yeah. bureaus in country, and this comes at the same time when you've seen that the Kremlin is willing to increase funding to state media outlets, so to RT, to open up new outlets, to rebrand right. Sputnik... I mean, that must be a factor there as well. Oh, it's a huge factor. I mean, RT's budget is, I believe, $300 million set to increase by 40% in the next year. I mean, this is the thing, right? Um, you know, in, in the 70s and 80s, during the Cold War, the KGB had this, this tactic or this, this form of tradecraft known as active measures. The idea mm. was to uh, plant bits of disinformation in the West with the hope of weakening or dividing or, or vitiating the West's response to Soviet aggression. Um, what we argue is, uh, look, whereas 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, active measures were, were actually quite difficult to perpetrate. And a famous example of this is the CIA invented the AIDS virus, right? That was a KGB concoction. Or hmm. better yet, the CIA assassinated John F. Kennedy. Also a KGB concoction planted in an Italian newspaper, which actually worked its way back to the Dallas prosecutor's office and in more recent pop cultural uh, memory was included in Oliver Stone's rather feverish uh, motion picture JFK. These things take time, or they used to take time. They used to take a lot of resources. Today, active measures have been completely mediated. With RT, you don't even have to go out and find somebody who you can trust, who you can cultivate. Because, you know, the internet has kind of opened this landscape of, of a kind of, you know, sort of, you know, a fever dream of conspiracy theorists and cranks and lunatics, guys sitting in their parents' basement who think the U.S. took down the World Trade Center, who believe the Pope is a reptilian, you know, space alien, uh, and all these kind of crazy things. You pay them $50, they write an article in 15 minutes, probably less given the quality of the stuff, and they click publish. And once they click publish, people start to read it. And, and, and by the way, people who read it don't necessarily buy it. I, I would hope they don't in the case of, say, the Pope is a reptilian space uh, alien. 
But, you know, it's clickbait, right? I mean, in, in new media terms, this is clickbait. When it's the speed and it's the way of approaching it that's changed, exactly. and it's that exactly. whole relativity of truth, and what do you I consume? An exact analog to the sort of CIA-invented AIDS active measure, and that is the CIA invented the Ebola virus as a form of biological weaponry. This was published on RT's uh, Spanish-language news service, right? And if we're being a little cynical here, we would say the idea is to, to have uh, audiences in Latin America, particularly the Chavista countries, pick this up because they're already inclined to anti-Western conspiracies or they believe the CIA is sort of the most nefarious uh, agency on the planet, and they'll take this at face value. All they'll say... Well, they use it for their, purposes. Purposes. Yeah, no, it for their own purposes. Yeah, no, and I mean, I think this is the point that you've made so well in the report, uh, partially that the media landscape is shifting and people don't quite know how to adjust to it. They don't have the media antibodies to process it all and to kind of separate right. the good from the bad, or at least from what's based on actual reporting from what's not. Well, I think that's all we have time for today, but thank you so much for joining us.